Good afternoon, DML. Okay, that was uh, moderately better. We are at the end of the conference. Um, yeah. Uh, and we are so happy that all of you are here with us at the end of the conference. This is actually like better than we expected. <laughs> this, is a, this is a nice size group. Um, so we didn't dwindle too much and that's, that's awesome. Um, so we want you to know that there's a survey and we would like you to um, take some time probably right now while I'm doing all the goofy warm-up stuff to, um, not while the igniters are talking, but you can do it while I'm talking, to fill out the survey. That gives us, um, gives the team here very useful feedback about your experience and all that will feed into the plans for next year and the Connected Learning Summit. In addition, eight very lucky people will win something. So. No, no, I made it eight, Mimi. Executive decision. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're going to put it on me. Yeah, I'm going out of my pocket. Um, so anyway, s between six and eight people, somewhere between six and eight, are going to win something. Um, but really, you're all winners because you're still here. So look underneath your chair. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I want to have an open moment. Everybody get some. Okay, sorry, it's a little silly. All right, so um, yes, let's get to it. This is the last Ignite talk of the last digital media and learning conference. I thought about that yesterday. I was like, this is these lovely people over here are like sending us off, and that's awesome. Um, and uh, I really want everybody in the room, again, to think about next year and maybe being part of the first Ignite talk at the Connected Learning Summit. Now, wouldn't it be great? Yeah. So who's thinking about it? Who's considering it? Maybe? Come on. Yeah? Yeah. Come on. I challenge us all um, to have the guts to do what these, these people over here are going to do for us today, sharing their ideas in uh, rapid fire succession five minute talks, um, it's really great. And yesterday was fabulous, but we're gonna end it with a bang. Uh, I am going to get us warmed up again <laughs> because we are all like fading slowly. Um, so just like yesterday, let's get, let's stand up. Stand up, 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 up. Wiggle it out, move it around. Oh, yeah, yeah, waddle it out. Wobble if you know how to do that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, do the, uh, uh, yep, some of us know how to wobble. Okay, so, um, wow, think about, this is more reflective of the last two days, like a really new idea, awesome idea, aha moment, something that made you pause and think. Think about that for a second. I see people looking up in the, you might close your eyes, you might look down, you might grab your notes. What's an idea that floated through your head and stopped right there? You were like, whoa, I gotta think about that a little bit more. Cause that's really exciting, or that's new, or that's something I wanna hold on to. Your eureka moment. Okay, great, now, if, that eureka moment had a movement, what would it be? Think about that. What would that moment be? I had so many eureka moments when Dana was talking at the beginning and I was like, oh snap! <laughs> right? That would be my moment. Okay, so in three seconds, I'll do a one, two, three. Think about that eureka moment, that new idea, that aha, it could have been an oops, could have been an old snap. And then I want you to put that energy in your body and send it out into this room, which will help our igniters get ignited and excited about what they're going to talk to us about this afternoon. Okay, is everybody ready? Okay, yeah. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> it's hard. Okay.
One, two, three. Oh, st- oh I, I missed it. I didn't even see it because I was doing my own movement. Okay. All right, so we're about to hear about sparking passions. We're about to hear about graphic novels and civic engagement. We're about to hear about how to support diverse learners. We're going to hear about movable games, and we're going to hear about gifts. Not the ones under your chairs, but the other ones. Oh, what is that? Oh, okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it starts now. Matt? Hello, hello, no pressure, I could always just hit escape, right? <laughs> so I'm Matt Farber, I'm a, a assistant professor of technology, innovation, and pedagogy at the University of Northern Colorado, and I write about games and learning, or a couple of books, and I uh, write for Edutopia also on the subject. Uh, but I'm going to start the story with Sean Berman. Uh, Sean Berman is a... Uh, seventh grade student from Queens, and he made a video game. Uh, He actually won the Games for Change Student Challenge last spring. His game is called Adventures in New York, and it was an autobiographical game about, or a biographical game, about his grandmother who emigrated from Russia to the United States. And uh, in the game, you play actually as the scratch cat, uh, and you communicate using English, but non-playable characters communicate back using wingdings. And I will let his intro here explain why it's so important to have students make games about serious topics. So to rewind a bit, I'm a former classroom teacher. I was a middle school teacher for nine years up until this past June. And I use serious games in my classroom like 1979 Revolution and um, board games also like Pandemic. And uh, NPR visited my class and ran a piece last spring about my use of the migrant trail in the classroom. Uh, But to use games like this in the classroom, even the migrant trail, which doesn't actually have a lot of what's called transportation theory to draw you into the experience, um, it takes a lot of framing. So this is a quote from one of my students. Uh, We were creating sequels to games using Twine, making interactive fiction story. And then I said, guess what? You're coding. Oh, I hate coding. That's because she was doing a lot of rote puzzle-based coding, not coding through self-expression. So I don't even use loaded words like coding, games, gamer. I like to start with empathy, though, because that's where you start making games. Um, This is an example of a student-made game. Uh, Two girls, age 12, made this game where you're uh, you're immigrants and you are border patrol. And it's an unwinnable system. They designed that on purpose. Uh, The mechanic is the message. Uh, So we asked ourselves, how can we scale this? How can we bring this attitude to more students? So um, we brought back to life the movable game jams, which Kevin Miklosh over there started with Alex Fleming from Mouse. And uh, we brought it back last year through a grant from the New York City Trust, um, along with Hive Digital Media Learning. We had three different locations, uh, three different themes, four different locations, future communities, climate change, and local stories and immigrant voices. We had these events at, again, four locations. So museum spaces, uh, Brooklyn College, four of the five boroughs in New York City. And we had different high partners involved from Mouse Institute of Play, for example. And uh, here are some images. Uh, We had uh, mentorship models. We had students play different games and then make different games. And we had four different breakout stations. So in the afternoon, well, we'd start in the morning, of course, uh, we would talk about parts of games. Uh, We'd have a simple hacking tic-tac-toe, for example. Uh, Because to make a game, you have to know what games are, game literacy, right? Uh, Then we had um, experts come in. So this is uh, inquiry-based learning. This is a a button hook, for those of you who don't know what a button hook might be from the 1700s. But that's a a museum expert from New York City uh, starting off the day. Uh, with inquiry-based learning. And then in the afternoon, this is from the uh, Local Stories and Immigrant Voices Game Jam, these students here were designing games based on that theme. And they're self-identifying their expertise. Maybe they're systems, maybe they're into um, designing the story or the narrative or the mechanics. And then, of course, we surveyed the students. 
And one of the more interesting things is students didn't realize that they could actually change a game and make it their own. Uh, here's an example from Global Voices. Uh, they created a scratch game where you play as a Syrian immigrant, and it's kind of like Flappy Bird. Uh, but I found this to be adaptable. I use this in my classroom because it's shared on Scratch. So, you know, you could share it anywhere. And uh, going back to Sean Berman and his game here, we wondered how can we make this scalable for even more than New York City? How can we reach more kids globally? So we created this. It's free. Download it. It's uh, on ETC Press. And it's the Game Jam Guide, and it's a curriculum of all of the lessons herein. And uh, I encourage you to check it out and share it. And thank you very much. Hi, I'm Gabriella, and I'm going to use my extra two seconds. Uh, in 2015, I stood on the Ignite stage and proposed an idea for a brand new graphic novel based on a 1911 textbook. And I'm here to say we made that a reality. And I want to tell you the story of how we took this analog, old school form and really brought it into being thanks to the powers of digital media. Um, <clears throat> if you don't know the 1911 textbook Wacker's Manual, it's the kids' version of the 1909 plan for Chicago, which is a plan for how Chicago could come into being after the Great Fire. A hundred-ish years later, we have incredible disparities. And when you don't have something like a textbook that helps you understand the building blocks of a city and tells you it's your job to take care of it, it can be very hard to interpret this kind of picture. There's two things to remember for the rest of this Ignite talk. One, there's a severe civic education opportunity gap, as severe as any learning gap we know about for young people of color, kids who are poor. And the second thing is, by the time the kids you're teaching today are grown-ups, most people will be living in cities. We created No Small Plans using a design brief that had input from teens, teachers, architects, planners, and we asked everybody the same question. What's most worth knowing and experiencing when it comes to urban planning and civic engagement. After a year of working with this design brief and some incredible artist illustrators who were my co-authors, we brought No Small Plans into being. In fact, it's one of the giveaways today. So what is No Small Plans? It's a graphic novel that follows the adventures of neighborhood kids in Chicago in the past, 1928, in the present, and the future. And in every single chapter, we have young people who are really wrestling with real issues in their lives, but it's also set in a real place. All of these pictures are based on real places in Chicago. You see Ida B. Wells' house in the lower right-hand side, for example. But the main thing about No Small Plans is that it's a curriculum of questions. And it's a curriculum of authentic problem solving by young people. How they make their decision is through data and crowdsourcing. But most important, it's about this process. How do you come to consensus when you have a very different set of background experiences? And in the future, there's still segregation and poverty and tensions. But at the end, they really do come up with a suggestion. We just don't know what it is. <laughs> Every chapter in the book ends with a map, because exploring Chicago is part of our hope and dream for this project. We couldn't get it funded. We could not get money to print this, so we turned to Kickstarter. And in 30 days, we were able to raise almost $60,000 from 1,200 backers around the world. Uh, <clears throat> but Kickstarter is like having a baby. If you've never done that before, it's like, oh my god, I'm so excited, and this is horrible. Because, uh, for example, if you're successful, that's really great, but you have to feed it like every 30 seconds. The books arrived. We didn't have a forklift to get them off the back of a truck. I mean, really basic, basic things. But the great thing is, in June, we launched Meet Your City, a three-year civic education initiative. And over the next three years, we will be giving away 30,000 copies of No Small Plans for free to Chicago teens. And we're working with Chicago public librarians and teachers and 20 plus community organizations to catalyze conversations about what makes a good neighborhood, including this free toolkit that you can find at architecture.org. But what's the real impact of this? Number one, if all they do is read the book, they're getting to see young people like them that they can relate to. There's questions at the back of the book. But we also know that our philosophy is to use no small plans 
as a catalyst, put it out in the world, and amazing projects are happening. Nine sixth graders are meeting with their aldermen to try to figure out what to do with this abandoned steel site. That's just one of 90 teachers at work. The reality is for a young person, there's no such thing as a small plan. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark Warshower. New media gurus like to argue that simply putting computers in children's hands without any technical or instructional support miraculously results in improved engagement and learning. But when we investigated such technocentric programs, we found that early dreams quickly turned into broken laptops, frustrated students, and a waste of money. That's why we need solid critical research into what works in digital learning and why. Unfortunately, too many ed tech advocates come in with ready-made answers. In contrast, we believe that these answers only come through asking compelling questions and then rigorously, rigorously analyzing a broad range of empirical data. The Digital Learning Lab at UCI does just that. Whether in language and literacy, new media development, or virtual learning, our lab digs deep to determine exactly how use of technology helps or hinders diverse learners in achieving their ends. We're investigating literacy practices in scores of school laptop programs through hundreds of hours of observations. Like in this class for English learners, we found that one key factor promoting success is a focus on collaborative writing. So we use social network analysis to study how students write together online identifying the factors that lead interaction to progress from teacher-dominated discussions early in the year to, students, to rich student-student interaction towards the end of the year. Digital media also allows new forms of joint authorship, so we've partnered with UCI's informatics department to use tools such as DocuViz, which supports collaboration by measuring exactly how and when individuals contribute to a jointly authored Google Doc. Also in the area of digital literacy, we've carried out the largest study yet on how students learn to write with computers. We compared 25,000 eighth grade digital writing samples to previous writing tests given on paper. Using teacher and student survey data and keystroke records during the test, we identified the precise role of pr prior computer use in improving digital writing, both directly and through changing students' drafting and revising processes. In another study, we're researching how new forms of digital text scaffolding can improve language and literacy development. Through experiments with 4,000 students, we found that an innovative technique called visual syntactic text formatting makes the underlying structure of text more clear to students. Reading this formatting an hour a week uh, improves students' subsequent language and literacy scores, especially for English learners. For media creation, we're partnering with schools in the Coachella Valley to study how immigrant students' involvement in digital storytelling. Students draw on cultural community resources to critically examine aspects of their life in a new medium. We're investigating the relationship in digital storytelling between media and print literacy and what instructional strategies are most effective to help students simultaneously develop their lifelong skills as filmmakers and writers. We've also examined the intersection of computational thinking and storytelling. Data from students in after-school programs has illuminated how use of Scratch helped learners develop their reading, writing, and programming ability at the same time. Based on this research, we have a new grant to partner with Santa Ana Orange and Orange County Schools to develop materials and resources for promoting computational thinking through media creation among bilingual children. For virtual learning, we're using clickstream data to pinpoint critical factors for success in online college classes. We found that A students log on and watch assigned videos every day of the week, whereas failing students put off all weekly assignments until Friday. I show this slide every week to my kids. <laughs> Based on this, we've developed nudge experiments to test whether reminding students to schedule their video watching can improve performance, especially for working students who have many other competing demands. Finally, in one of our favorite projects, we're promoting the use of telepresence robots to allow kids with cancer and heart disease to continue attending school from home. Typically, such homebound students suffer from isolation and fall behind in school. 
Our interviews with families have shown that telepresence can make a profound difference in students' social and emotional well-being, as well as their educational outcomes, by reconnecting students to their friends, classmates, and teachers. We invite you to join us as collaborators and researchers in UCI's Digital Learning Lab and help us develop the tools and knowledge to enable all learners to powerfully contribute to the world's digital future. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelsey Hammer. I'm a librarian at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, all the way from the East Coast. And today I'm going to be talking about a new program that we're launching at UNC, and more specifically, a new media that we're using to engage students with connected learning, design literacy, and library resources. Now, the reason that I haven't said the name of this presentation yet is because in a second, I'm going to draw a line in the room, and everyone's going to turn on each other, and it's going to get crazy. Um, <laughs> but I tell my students is we have to choose one. So today, I will be saying GIF. I apologize to all the GIFers out there. Um, but we have to choose one. So what is a GIF? Uh, it's an animated looping image. They're really popular. I've actually seen them across the conference this week uh, in presentations, seeing people making them. They're super awesome. They're usually three to five seconds long, really, really popular on social media sites like Twitter, Reddit, and Tumblr. But what I always tell uh, facilitators, students, and teachers that I'm working with is that GIFs are more than just a format. They're not the dancing baby. They're not the like angel flapping wings. Or they go beyond even BuzzFeed articles. GIFs are a new and developing medium. And the reason for that is because they capture something that only motion can capture. They capture art, humor, reaction, and emotion. They tell stories in a different way. It's the difference between a smile and smiling. And so we wanted to think about what would it look like at UNC if we created a gift making and sharing competition? What if we had students capturing their culture around them, sharing it with others, and spreading their community and engaging with one another through gifts? So we came up with something called Gifable UNC. So Gifable UNC is about becoming GIF-able, developing design and digital literacy skills, but also looking for Gifable moments in their community and sharing those with each other. And we wanted this to be something that would really engage students. They have unlimited entries, and they can vote, and everyone gets to see what's going on in their community. Now, sometimes teachers ask me, why GIFs? What's important about GIFs? The first thing is composition. At its basis, composition is about telling a big story in a small space, and that's exactly what a GIF is. And students can learn that skills with GIF making. It's also an exercise in perception. It's an abstract form. You only have three to five seconds. You have no sound. And so you have to decide every single frame what is going to be important and how it's going to be perceived. It's also an invitation. Say you're a student working on a student film or you have a portfolio. You can make GIFs of that and tweet those out and invite others to come see your work, come see your research, and come see your art. It's also a great community object because we have students capturing their community, but also sharing their community online in a digital world. So we ask students, go out. If you've got a, a club or an organization or your protest, go and gift that, and then come back to the, your digital community and share that and begin discussions, begin discourse about what's happening at UNC today in 2017 and also in the past. We wanted students to also develop design and digital literacy skills. Students can learn things like placement, uh, like how much white space I should use, what kind of text I should choose with design skills like GIF making. Now the big question I get is how you actually make GIFs. At UNC, uh, students have access to free Adobe, so we use things like Photoshop, Premiere, and After Effects. But you can actually take any video or photo on your phone and put it in a Giphy app or on the Giphy Creator online and make a GIF really easy. The next question I get from teachers is what kind of material should I use? We tell teachers, have your students film each other, have them go to their community. We also partnered with UNC Archives to bring out primary sources and archive material and have students make those archive materials come to life. The next question is sharing. We want students to use our hashtag, we want them to text these gifts to each other, but we also wanted to have an online forum where they could go and download any gifts that other students make so they can share those out with each other as well. And so the most important thing that I want to share about empowering students to make gifts is that we're building a new language. You think about this week, they added a bunch of emojis to our phones, right? But we didn't get to create that. We get to create our own digital language with gifts. In a social, digital, and visual world, we are creating this language together. We can make this language equitable. We can make it diverse, fun, engaging, because we have the power to choose what those words are and how we communicate and what that looks like. 
And so I think my favorite thing about Gifable UNC and about GIFs in general is that they're a great tool for connected learning. They engage with the community, with self-interest, with openly networked tools, um, and they're also a great way to share other connected learning projects that you might have because they're also great tools of invitation. And we're also creating a forever moving portrait of what UNC is like. All of the GIFs that are created are being put into the archive. So later, someone will look back and say, this is what 2017 was like. And I know that because I can see it, and I'm also seeing it in a media form that is specific to 2017 and to the modern age. And so I invite you, uh, there were no gifts in this presentation, because I invite you to check out the hashtag and see what our Carolina students are making and how they're capturing the UNC community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelsey. All right, let me begin by first off thanking the selection committee who thought that this story, my story, was worthy of being part of DML 2007. The story begins in spring 2009 when I began searching for an assistant principalship while I was in an elementary school. At that time, I was working as a teacher at CICS Basel, which is a typical pre-K to eight school on Chicago South Side. It was about 98% African American, 99% qualified free and reduced lunch. Not a lot of resources, but always finding a way to do more or less. My search led me to Arlington Heights and Thomas Middle School, 31 miles away. 930 students, 0.03% African American, and about 5% qualified and free and reduced lunch. Significant differences. It was at Thomas that my superintendent decided to send me to an administrative conference. It was in Jiangsu Province, China. CICS and Thomas were very different, and that 31-mile drive drawn the education from the first place and what I hoped to accomplish. It was really like driving between two different worlds. Back to that trip in China in 2010. Whether you are comfortable calling it a calling, an awakening, or a quickening, something happened in my heart while I was on that trip. And I knew that I would only be happy working, building, um, building our programs for students that would help them to make connections to after school programming. When I returned to my district, I was a man on a mission. And I became involved in launching students across different states, regions, and nations, after school programs, and all sorts of things. Um, and I really felt like I was living the dream, to tell you the truth. The picture you see here is my first trip, 2012, when I was at the Great Wall of China, when I was at Badaling. And there, that is Michelle Obama, and I'm not in the picture, but we were celebrating at the Summer Up Palace um, with my students from SD25. I was also um, really motivated to come back to start a not-for-profit because changing the district really wasn't enough. So I started a not-for-profit to help students, specifically disadvantaged students, to make connections to after-school after school programs. Um, I noticed in the process of trying to get traction for Mosaic, that there was an opportunity for a $1,000 grant. If you could come up with an idea that would be really awesome within your community or your city. And I thought, wouldn't it be neat if the whole city could come together to celebrate students making connections around um, different after school programs. And I thought about the different parties you could have. You could have backless shoe parties and you could have back, you could have backless dress parties. And I did make some changes along the way from one night to 37 days. Why did it become 37 days? It became 37 days because I was really motivated to find some way to move all of the positive energy that's at the end of the calendar year to the beginning of the school year. And you think of all the fun there is at the end of the calendar year. You've got Thanksgiving, you've got Diwali, the, uh, this Festival of Lights, you've got Hanukkah, you've got Christmas, you've got Kwanzaa, you've got Las Posadas, you've got Eid, Eid al Adha, you've got, and then the big one, of course, is New Year's. And you think of all that fun that's in those 37 days. And in my own mind, I thought, how do I move that to the beginning of the school year for students to celebrate them finding some sort of a connection to after school? And um, it also forced me to think about inclusion and what it meant to build something in a way, symbolically, for those students who are a part of Basel, you know, 98, 99% versus those who are part of a Thomas and how to help them to make that connection. In 1924, Carter G. Woodson um, launched Negro Week. And at that point, it was the idea that if he could educate African Americans about themselves um, and about their accomplishments and contributions, that that would change them and change their perspective on themselves, which might, at that point, change some of the some of the prejudice against them. Um, and in 1970, at Kent State University, 
uh, the Black United Student Front, I think it was, decided to uh, move um, Negro Week to what we celebrate now as Black History Month. And um, this idea of enlarging what was already there, and so we, if we're celebrating the accomplishments during one week, why not even enlarge that to 30 days? Um, and just this idea of moving that sort of energy to the beginning of the year. Um, you're really the next link in that chain of what's kind of been a weird road for me from China to School District 25 and now back to this point, and you're kind of the next link in the chain. I think in some way that maybe someone here, maybe an organization here has that same idea about something as big as a whole new holiday season. Um, find a way to make a connection to me. Um, I just wanted to kind of end with that thought that I'm on board and just going to be really devoted to it. This is it. <laughs> I remember the first day my dad brought home that TRS-80 computer. I was so excited, and I immediately started to program it. I saw it as a thing I could create with, but I'm going to make an argument that the computer is actually the problem. But first, we're going to talk about this tree. This was the tree in our house this past holiday season, and I made it for the single and solitary reason that I thought it would be awesome, and it was awesome. It was on Twitch. It was amazing. You could change it over the internet and watch the colors change, and my cousins thought it was the best thing they'd ever seen. Now, why am I talking about this tree? What I didn't expect was that my daughter, who refused to learn programming, no matter how much I tried to convince her, couldn't wait to start working on this tree. Here's a GIF for you, Kelsey. <laughs> GIF, not GIF. Um, <clears throat> and she insisted, Dad, will you teach me how to make some more animations for the tree? And I said, sure. And she started, and she started making animations, and here's some of her code. And in fact, by the time we were done, most of the code was written by her. That got me thinking. I got together with my wife, and we brainstormed a little bit, and we reached out to some friends of ours at a place called Digital Nest. Digital Nest is this amazing nonprofit in a low-income community called Watsonville uh, in the Bay Area, and they're basically a hamago place, a homago place. Uh, you kids come in, they hang out, they mess around, and they geek out, and pretty soon they're using computers. We got in touch with especially Yasmin, who was our main collaborator here, told her about the tree, and she said, I've got a great idea. Let's do it. We'll get a few kids, we'll get a few girls in, and we'll just see if this can work out and be fun. Yasmin had a cool idea, which was to reenact that famous scene from Stranger Things <laughs> with an Arduino and some LEDs where it went into writers communicating with, uh, I don't know, the dead or the upside down. We scheduled it for three Saturdays, three hours each, four kids. That was going to be tough. And we had a great time. The baby came too. Um, <clears throat> and it really, really went well. This is a picture of the kids working. They stayed more than three hours each of the three days. And I want to point out particularly one thing. The cell phone stayed out. And I knew I was winning when that cell phone was picked up. And she took a picture of her project, and she put it on Instagram. And I said, we're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere. Had another kind of neat lesson, which is I made them put safety glasses on when they were using the heat gun, which is really pretty much unnecessary. But as soon as they put on safety glasses, they were into it. They're like, wow, this is dangerous. Let's do more. <laughs> when we got to the end of it, they all had animating boards, and they were using an array to type out little messages, like to their mom or to their little brother. And we took a selfie, like you always do at the end of a digital nest project. And this is our selfie. It was a big, big success. I'll show you a little bit of some survey results. Kind of small in, four. <laughs> um, but we did move them. And, and one of the things that I wanted to kind of impress is we talked engineering. We talked about what's a circuit. Why would you put a resistor in a circuit? Uh, what changes when you put a diode in a circuit? Because an LED is a diode. We went over all these kind of things. And they really kind of got it. But my favorite part was this. I would love to share this with some of my friends. I would love to do it again. And this is a, you'll see a little bit more data, too, where they said, I would also love to engage with it online. I would love to do more projects like this. And I think by getting away from the screen, by making the project something other than the keyboard and the screen, something was changing just as it had changed for my daughter when she was messing around with the Christmas tree. I encourage you to think of an Arduino, because I know many of you are going to be using them, as not a computer. It never has been a computer. If you know the history of Arduino, which is super cool, 
uh, when Hernando Barragan invented wiring, which was the predecessor to Arduino, he's an artist. He was frustrated by the tools he could use to create digital art and created wiring, which then morphed into Arduino. It was never meant to be a computer. It's meant to be a thing for art. And it still is. At UC Santa Cruz, we call this computational media. And the two people on the end, Catherine Isbister and myself, are two of us that are really into these kind of wearable tools. And you know, there are lots and lots of people that are really inspiring to me that are also working in this area. This is just people that I've met. Um, and in particular, I'll point out Anouk Wiprecht, who you may not be aware of, who does amazing, 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 also very expensive, but amazing <laughs> uh, wearables that is worth looking up on YouTube. And these are some of the things I think I learned. I think there's no reason you can't be technical as long as you make it playful and fun, and maybe getting away from the screens is helpful. And I'm gonna close with this. A week from today, we're doing another one. <laughs> this time with 15 kids, we're gonna make these headbands. And I'm taking some of my grad students out and we're gonna have a great time again at Digital Nest. And also it's up on Instructables, as you can see here. It's on the front page of Instructables today. I'm super proud of that. And uh, I hope you all had a fantastic DML. <laughs>
and we look forward to seeing you there. And I want to thank, of course, Mimi, uh, my partner in crime, as always. <laughs> but, uh, so see you next year in Boston in the middle of a hazy, hot, and humid summer. Um, <laughs> uh, and I look forward to seeing you all there. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, so I guess we get to close out with the um, fun giveaways. You've probably seen the staff and volunteers sporting the cool DML t-shirts. So we have a few of those to give away. Actually, Sybil was right. We have eight things to give away. So you sh Sybil's always right. Um, and then you heard about the awesome books from the Chicago Architecture Foundation already. So we have a couple copies of those. And then I wanted to just share our last uh, giveaway item is a really fun project that we coordinated at the, um, here at the Hub with the Connected Learning Alliance. Uh, we partnered with the National Writing Project and YALSA, the Young Adult Library Services Association. Um, and we had two partners in the internet world, DeviantArt, which is the biggest platform for um, you know peer-to-peer -peer sharing of uh, art, uh, very youth-centered, and Wattpad, which is kind of a counterpoint uh, that is mostly uh, focused around writing, um, around publishing. And we launched a team challenge on the two uh, platforms to the prompt twist fate. And we had some wonderful judges, uh, curators, um, and eventually it resulted in a book that you can view all of the um, winning entries, um, the curated entries online, but we also have a beautiful uh, print version that's being circulated in public libraries all over the country. It's a very limited edition item, um, one print run. So we have one copy of Twist Fate to give out. And so when I call your name, just come up, uh, wave, uh, and then you can go pick, you know, whoever gets called first gets to pick the first, um, the first item. So. I'll put this over in the table there. So, drum roll. <laughs> uh, the first winner is Jason Evans Groth. Yay, Jason! Congratulations. <laughs> okay, our second winner is Jeremy Dietmeyer. Jeremy, are you here? Awesome. I guess so you do have to be here to win. So this is good. So far, so good. Our third winner is David Quinn. Is David here? Yay! Yeah. Um, our fourth winner is Jeremy Dean. Jeremy. <laughs> our fifth winner is is Hui Chang. Hui Chang, yeah. Yay! <laughs> Our sixth winner is Sophia Bender. Yay, awesome. And our seventh winner is Leanna Gamber Thompson. Leanna, are you here? Is Leanna here? Leanna left. Oh, Leanna. Darn. Okay. So number seven is Chelsea Haig. Is Chelsea here? Oh. <laughs> Uh, future in hand. And I th so we have one more, right? Okay, I'm, I can count, I can. Uh, and then our final winner is Tori, trust. Is Tori here? Yeah. Yay! Oh, yeah. So thank you everybody for doing this, filling out the surveys, and most of all for being part of this community and joining us, and look forward to seeing you next year in MIT. <laughs>